Good morning. Good to see all of you here. We are taking a break, as you can see from your bulletin from the book of Joshua, and we'll do that again next week. Christmas season, and so we're going to have a text that is appropriate to that. Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 7, but in the sermon itself, we'll concentrate on verses 6, mainly verse 6 and verse 7. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. And with gladness, with the gladness of harvest, and men re, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden, and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of tumult, and cloak rolled in blood, will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this this time together. It's a great privilege to be with your people. It is... uh, time of the year when we remember in a special way the birth of your son, the giving of your son to be the savior of the world. And so, Father, we we can uh, spend this time well when we think about him. It is uh, very easy to get distracted by the commercialism of it. But we take this time this morning to focus upon him and who he is and why he came and what the Christmas season is really about. And as we do that, we should also reflect on the fact that this is not something that is seasonal. This is something that is annual. It's every day of the year that we are to be reflecting upon the incarnation, Christ becoming flesh coming into this world. And so, Lord, I pray that we would focus our attention on that, that we would uh, uh, consider things from this text that uh, remind us of that and who he is and what he's done, what you've done in giving your son for us. We give you thanks and praise for that. And we praise you for being the sovereign God of the universe. The Lord, over time, and space, and sending him in the fullness of time, as Paul put it, to come and do what he did, to become a child in order to be a man who would suffer in our place. So, Father, bless us with that and help us to focus our attention correctly on him, and and may this be a time in which he's honored and we're edified through our time of of study and worship together. Father, we remember the material needs that we have, particularly we remember the the health issues that we all face in this particular time 
of pandemic, and we think of those in particular need, those who are weakened in their physical condition. We pray your, your blessing upon them. We pray for Madeline Hargrove and Audrey Harrell, Betty Radford and Margaret Smith. We pray for them in particular, but others, Lord, as well, who uh, have gone through difficulties of a physical nature. We think of Laura Hatch also, who is grieving for her father, but not as one who grieves without hope because uh, we know that he's with you and, and uh, he's rejoicing at this moment. What a great thing it is to be able to come to a time in life where a, lo a loved one is lost to us, but only momentarily, and we have the hope of seeing that person again. Father, we have that hope because of what your Son has done for us, and so again, we pray you'd bless us as we uh, give attention to that, as we turn to this great passage in Isaiah. Bless us, build us up in the faith. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes novels have memorable first sentences like, Moby Dick, Call Me Ishmael or Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. There are chapters in the book of Isaiah like that. Chapter 42, Behold My Servant. Chapter 40, Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says the Lord. Chapter 9 begins, There will be no more gloom. That's a good line and good news. And it comes as a surprise because the previous verse, the last verse of chapter 8, is about people being driven away into darkness and into gloom. Then suddenly, no more gloom. When Isaiah wrote, it was the worst of times, but it would become the best of times. That's the prophecy. It was good news for Israel at that time and good news for the world now, living in gloomy, troubling times. If you only read or watch the news, you have reason to see gloom, but not if you read the Bible, because there we find hope. We find it here in Isaiah 9 and the prophecy of a child with four names. Isaiah lived when there were wars and rumors of war. The Assyrian Empire had invaded the northern kingdom of Israel, devastated Galilee, and threatened Jerusalem in the south. Isaiah had reason to despair, but then chapter 9 begins with hope and the promise of a great light shining on the people of Galilee, a people who, were, who had walked in darkness. There will be gladness and an end to war. And the prophet unfolds all of this in the first seven verses. One of the great chapters on peace in the Bible. It is not an elusive dream. It is not an empty hope. There will be peace on earth, not because of human effort, not because of a military deterrent or diplomats or statesmen, but because of a child. That's how Isaiah begins, verse 6, for a child will be born. This is no ordinary child. It is the child Isaiah prophesied earlier in chapter 7, whose name is Emmanuel. In fact, chapter 9 is in the middle of what is called the Emmanuel book, in which from chapter 7 through 12, a series of prophecies is given of a child with unusual names. In fact, the story of the child is largely told in his names, which have great meaning. Emmanuel means God with us. And in that name is revealed the hope of the world. Here is the hope of the Galileans who are described as walking in darkness. He would live and walk among them. 
He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew makes that clear. He quotes these verses in the fourth chapter of his gospel as referring to him. He is the Messiah who, according to verse 7, will sit on David's throne. He's Israel's king who came into Galilee preaching repentance and the kingdom of heaven. He came as a, a great light in a dark place proclaiming hope and salvation. That was a long time ago. We still have wars. And so we might wonder what all of this means. Is this a prophecy or just a wish for peace? The ideal, not the real. Only a sentimentality. Well, the answer to that is it, this is prophecy. And it is true. Because when the Lord came, He did establish peace in the hearts of His people. And He laid the ground for peace throughout the world. That's the reason for the child. God became man. Emmanuel, in order to make things right, to remove sin and bring salvation, bring eternal life. That is Isaiah's prophecy. God would become a child. And this child is also a son. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. The language describing his birth is, is unusual, but carefully chosen. Jesus Christ was born as a child in his human nature. He was born of a woman, Paul wrote in Galatians 4, verse 4, just as you and I were. So in his humanity, he was born a child, but he was given as a son, because as God's son... Jesus Christ cannot be born. He is eternal, being of the same substance as the Father. He can only be given. And so it is often put that way in the New Testament. He was sent. He was given. It is an indication that the child and son is a man and much more. Now, that's made very clear later in the verse where he is described as mighty God. It is the promise that the infinite would be joined to the finite, the divine to the human, when Jesus, or perhaps better to say, the Son, or as John puts it in the first chapter of his gospel, the Word was sent into this world. Can we fully understand these things? No, we can't. There is, is great mystery in Isaiah's words and in the Lord's incarnation, His becoming flesh, which is beyond the grasp of, of finite creatures. Spurgeon said, Well might a gnat seek to drink in the ocean, as a finite creature to comprehend the eternal God. Well, if we could comprehend Him, He would not be infinite. So Jesus Christ, as Son, was born, was not born, I should say, He is given. And He was given as a gift. That was His own testimony, or the testimony of John, and if so, the testimony of Christ through John in that great statement of faith, for God so loved the world that He gave and sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Well, that's the message. No more gloom. Life and light. That's the reason He came. He came to establish His kingdom and to gather His people into it, to deliver them from darkness. And that's indicated in the next line of Isaiah's prophecy, which states that the government will rest on the child's shoulders. That's a child with great shoulders. He is a king, 
and he will rule. Now every ruler has a title and often an impressive name. Charlemagne, Charles the Great, Peter the Great, Lorenzo the Magnificent. But nothing can compare to the name of the prince in Isaiah 9. He has four of them. And they are not only impressive, they have meaning. They reveal his character. We're familiar with them from Handel's Messiah, which followed the King James Version with five names, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Probably, though, there are only four names. The parallel between them requires that we understand them as four compounds or four combination of words so that his names are Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Unusual names, which reveal how amazing and complex this person is. He is a child, yet a counselor. He is a son, yet a father. There's no contradiction or paradox here. Each name is given in order to re reveal his person and character, and four are given because that cannot be revealed in one name. In fact, each of these names is an enlargement on his name, Emmanuel. They are, as one writer said, glorious names and names that should give the Christian comfort and strength throughout his or her life in the worst of times as well as the best of times. Well, let's look at these four names. The first, Jesus is Wonderful Counselor. That's good news. Otherwise, we would be like those Gentiles, those Galileans, rather, in verse 2, who walk in darkness. But in this dark world, this confusing world, we have a counselor. And he is no common counselor. He is called wonderful. And that word is full of meaning. It's actually a noun, not an adjective. Literally, it is wonder. And it's used in the Bible of God's miracles. For example, it's used in, in Psalm 78 of the miracles that God did at the Exodus when He divided the Red Sea and He led Israel through the desert in a pillar of cloud and fire. So this child, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a wonder child. Someone beyond our comprehension because of His deity and, and one who does wonderful things and gives wise counsel. He has been a counselor from all eternity. He was part of the eternal counsel of the triune God, forming the plan of salvation, the creation of the world, and the providence that would govern it. The world does not run on mere laws like um, a watch that someone winds up and lets run down. The Lord controls every wheel of the world. He governs history in all of its parts. That means that He governs our lives according to His perfect counsel. So, while life is filled with twists and turns that we don't understand, that can be confusing, it is going in God's way. God's providence is full of mysteries, but no mistakes. He planned your existence from all eternity. It fits within His all-wise counsel. And the Christian can be assured that all is for his or her good. Again, Spurgeon said, God is too wise to err in His predestination and too good to be unkind. We can be assured that the counsel that in the council of eternity, the best was ordained that could have been ordained. 
If you could change anything, and sometimes we want to do that. We don't like our circumstances. They're hard. They're difficult. But if you could change anything, you wouldn't make it better. You'd make it worse. So we rest in His all-wise counsel. You may not understand it, but we know by faith that it's best in moving toward a great end. We have an all-wise guide in the Lord Jesus Christ, one who knows our condition. He knows our condition because He's experienced it all in His own life, in His humanity. And He knows how best to meet our needs. Whatever our situation, however hard and, and hopeless it seems, Christians have a wonderful counselor who does miracles for us. And as we follow His leading, He guides us in paths of peace. We have that assurance. And the reason we have it is given in His second name. It makes plain what was only indicated in the first name. He is Mighty God, El Gibor. Some have tried to reduce the meaning of this name and make it only a, a lofty title of a man. Uh, the word mighty, Gabor, is also a word that's, that means something like hero. And so some have translated it God hero as referring to someone like King Hezekiah, faithful king who was a, a hero to his people. But the word El. It's a very common word for God, and all through the book of Isaiah, it is used of God Himself. And that's the meaning here. This child is everything that this name indicates. He is God. And because He is, He is mighty and strong to save. That's why He came into the world. The great mythical hero of the ancient world was Hercules, famous for his strength. Stories were told about his 12 labors. One of them, the sixth labor, was cleaning the Augean stables. They had uh, 3,000 oxen in them and had not been cleaned for 30 years. But Hercules cleaned them in a day. It was an achievement of great strength. But it's a myth. Christ is real. He is true. And He came to do something far greater than that. To clean the Augean stables of the human heart. And to purge the world of sin. Not by becoming a strong man. But by becoming a child. This mighty God emptied Himself. Paul told the Philippians. Taking the form of a bondservant. Now, he didn't empty himself of deity. God cannot do that. He cannot deny himself. As the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, he emptied himself by laying aside the rights and the prerogatives of his deity. He became a servant. In fact, I think what Paul is saying there is he emptied himself, meaning he became a servant. And as a man, as a servant, he lived under the authority of the Father in perfect obedience to Him. And that perfect obedience led Him to the cross of Calvary where He saved His people from their sins. And in that, in, in the cross, we see both the wisdom and the power of the wonderful Counselor and the mighty God. Only God can find the lost. Only He can free the guilty. Only He could devise a plan in which the immortal became mortal to die in our place and save our souls. And only He could accomplish it. The third name of the child is Eternal Father. What an unusual name for one who is called a child and a son. The child is the father. But there's no contradiction here. Isaiah was not saying that the son is the father and the father is the son and so 
confusing the persons of the Godhead. This is not a description of Christ's relationship within the Trinity, but of His relationship to us. The Son acts toward us like a father. Psalm 103, verse 13 states, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. In other words, he loves us and he cares for us. And his fatherly care for us is defined as eternal. He never stops caring for us. He never wavers in His love for His people. His love cannot grow because it's infinite. It's unlimited. There's no room for it to grow because it, is, it fills everything. It cannot diminish because it is unchangeable. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. We change, but He does not. Our affection and faithfulness wax and wane, but He's always the same. Circumstances don't change Him. When we are faithless, He remains faithful. And in His great love for us, He never lets us go. He draws us back to Himself, always, always goes after us, after His lost sheep. He called Himself the Good Shepherd. And that uh, image of the shepherd expresses the idea here of the Father. He loves like that, concernedly and unconditionally. His fourth name is Prince of Peace. What a beautiful name. And it is His name because that is what He came to bring. Peace to individuals and peace to the world. You used to see bumper stickers, really not all that long ago, that said, visualize world peace. But that's about all people can do. Uh, they can imagine it, like John Lennon, but they can't produce it. John Foster Dulles was Secretary of State under Dwight Eisenhower. He was discussing the problem of peace in the world and the relative success some nations have had with it. He spoke of the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome that lasted 180 years. And then there was the Pax Britannica that lasted about a century. They produced relatively peaceful times. But then he said, the world today is very different from the world of past centuries. It cannot be ruled. And I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. But really, it's never been successfully ruled by anyone. Even the Romans could only keep the peace by means of the sword. It can only be ruled by God, who rules it providentially, completely from beginning to end. He is reigning and ruling over this world now, but someday He will establish His peaceful reign upon the earth through His Son who will govern this world as the Prince of Peace. There will be a kingdom that comes in which it will be a golden age for this world, an age of peace. Christ will reign. His kingdom will be glorious. His kingdom will be endless. That's where our passage ends. Verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of His government or of peace on the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. That's the future. It, it is what Time and the ages are moving toward the kingdom to come, world without end, with righteousness, peace, and glory. And it will come. The world has never known that, and the world can never accomplish it, but the Lord will. He's zealous to do that. That's how our verse ends. He's zealous to bring these things about. 
and nothing can frustrate the Lord. So we should think on that. I think that's very important. That's our hope. It's our future. We should meditate upon that and reflect upon the fact that this world is going to be a peaceful, glorious world someday. History is moving in that way. And it will happen because this king is zealous for that. But peace is not reserved for the future. It is the present reality of all who have put their faith in Christ. He is the Prince of Peace for them, for us, now. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. His death gained that for us, for His people, His elect. At the cross, He paid the penalty for all our sins. He ended our hostility toward God and removed His wrath from us. He made us friends. He made us sons and heirs of that, that glorious kingdom to come. He is our counselor and wonderful in His wisdom. He is our God and mighty to save and protect. He's like a father with an eternal love for us that gives peace in troubled times. This passage, as I said earlier, is familiar to us in part because of Handel's Messiah, which is often performed at Christmas, and so we tend to think of it as Christmas music. But the Messiah was first performed, not in December, but in April of 1742. And I think that is appropriate, because the subject of Christmas the birth of Christ, is for all seasons. It's for every Sunday of the year. It's for every day of the week. It is an event that, that we will marvel over for all eternity, that God became man, that mighty God became a little child for us. We, we may fear that... Um, we're slipping into the dark ages. But even so, God is in control. He has a plan that is unfolding according to His wonderful, wise counsel. And so we can have peace in troubled times. In the worst of times, Isaiah did. But that peace is only for those who trust in Christ as Savior who died in the place of sinners and conquered death in His resurrection. So if you have not done so, give yourself to Him. Believe in Him. The story is told about the Greek statesman and philosopher, Salon. He was a <clears throat> wise and selfless ruler and on a certain day, it was the custom to give him a present. So one came to him and gave him gold. Another came who couldn't afford to give gold, so he gave silver. One brought a fine robe. Another some delicacy for food. But one of them came up and said, Oh, Salon, I am poor. I have nothing to give you but I will give you something better than all these have given. I give you myself. That's all the Lord wants from you. You have nothing else to give Him. Paul said, our best is rubbish. Isaiah said, your righteousness is as filthy rags. But all who come to Him and believe in Him are changed and made His children. So if you've not trusted in Christ, do that. Give yourself to Him. And who better to give yourself to than the one who is wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. May God help you to do that and help all of us to seek to serve Him faithfully. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank You for 
this, this time together. We celebrate this great um, event once a year in, in this way, but as I said, we should think about the birth of Christ every Sunday and every day. We have a Savior who came into this world in the fullness of time, at the right time, at the perfect time in your providence, when the law had served its purpose and men stood condemned and He came in order to take that condemnation in Himself. And He died there on the cross. He suffered our death for us in our place, and then you raised him from the dead. And there too, we should think about that event, not just once a year, but every day, because we live in light of that, and we as your people have that life within us now, resurrection life. It's all a great gift. And so we thank you for the great gift of life in your son. We thank you for giving him, sending him, bringing him into this world and the life that we have in Christ. May we honor Him and you in the way we live. We thank you for Him. It's in His name we pray. Amen. I'm reading from Luke's Gospel. When the hour had come, the Lord Jesus sat down and the twelve apostles with Him. Then He said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, I'd like to make two comments about this passage. In the ESV, we read in verse 15, I have earnestly desired to take this supper with you. The one that I read says, I have desired, I have with fervent desire desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Some of the translations speak with stronger language about how desirous he was to share this supper with them. Notice Philip's paraphrase translation. You do not know how much I have longed to eat this supper with you. Now I think there's something significant about this. I wish I could take credit for it, but something Dr. Johnson said in one of his messages caused me to think about this. And what I think is this. We come to this meeting and we have for many years, most of us, and we come out of obedience. He asked us to do this. But I don't know that I ever really contemplated how pleasing it is to him that we do this. He says, with fervent desire. Philip's paraphrase says, you do not know how much I have longed to eat this Passover with you. What I am suggesting is that there is supernatural hidden blessing in us observing this supper. In us observing this supper properly. Now how is it that we observe this supper properly? Well, I think he gives us a hint. 
because his last words in the section that I read were, do ye this in remembrance of me. As we look at the bread, as we look at the cup, we think of the various facets of his atoning work. The jeweler looks at a diamond and he looks at it from all different angles and sides and he sees the beauty in it. Well, as we look at all the different facets of the atoning work of the Lord Jesus, we see beauty in them all. And more importantly, as we do that, it pleases him. As I said, he gives us a hint. And when I found that Dan was going to use as a text today, Isaiah chapter 9, it became very obvious to me that a text that we could look at that gives us several of these different facets of his atoning work a text written hundreds of years, in fact, before the Lord Jesus came. A text that really sounds more like a New Testament text in some ways than the old. And a text that has been called the Mount Everest of Messianic prophecy. And it is Isaiah chapter 52 beginning in verse 13 and going through chapter 53. 15 verses, and as I said, there are five different facets of his atoning work here. So every three verses, we have a different facet. I would like to just go through those very briefly, and then we will read that glorious text. First, in chapter 52, in verses 13 through 15, the suffering servant is successful. This is a summary, these three verses, of his degradation and his exaltation. Because he acts so sinlessly, so wisely, so prudently, so perfectly, in submission to his Father's will, unto death and even death on a cross, his work is successful. His Father is satisfied. The holy and righteous God is satisfied with his great work of atonement. And the sins of his people are forgiven. In this very text, we see, and I don't have time to develop it, but I commend it to you, the result of that acceptance is his resurrection, his ascension, and his session, all within these three verses. Chapter 53, verses 1 through 3. The suffering servant's life was largely misunderstood he came to his own, the nation Israel, and his own knew him not. The Son of God and the Son of Man was despised and rejected because he was unrecognizable apart from the enabling power and will of God. Even his disciples were confused after his death about his identity and his mission. Thirdly, another facet of the suffering servant was as a substitute. I count 10 references in these verses. We, us, our. He bore our griefs. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all.
Fourthly, the suffering servant was submissive to the will of his father. He opened not his mouth to assess blame or to protest in any way. He was resolute to follow the imagery of the sacrificial lamb of Exodus chapter 12. And finally, the suffering servant's life and death was all foreordained. His atoning work is the only acceptable solution for the sins of his people to satisfy the demands of a holy and a righteous God. He is truly our Passover lamb. The plan hatched in eternity past by the Godhead was all designed to bring salvation to the souls of men. I'd like to read the passage now. It's a glorious passage. You're familiar with it. We have read it so many times in this meeting. Isaiah chapter 52 beginning in, chapter, in verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently or successfully. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high, a reference to his resurrection, his ascension, and his session. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. This is a reference to his second coming. Who has believed our report? And to whom? Has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, 
I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Shall we give thanks for the bread? Our Father, we thank you for this glorious passage written hundreds of years before the event. The past, the present, and the future all unfold at your command. We thank you for the foreordained, the matchless and unspeakable gift of your Son. We thank you that by your grace we have become enabled to esteem him for who he really is. The Savior of the world, specifically the Savior of a people and elect a chosen people from before the very foundations of the world. We thank you now for this bread which symbolizes to us his body beaten, bruised, bloodied, punctured, and marred in appearance, Isaiah says, more than any man. We thank you for his willingness to act as our substitute and to bear the sins that were rightfully our own, the wrath that was due us was poured out on him, and by his stripes we are healed. We thank you for the certainty of your acceptance of his atoning work through his resurrection, his ascension, and his session, and all the blessings that accrue to us as a result. And we thank you that these unbelieving Jews in his day who esteemed him not will be replaced by Jewish people in his second coming who by your grace will recognize him as the strong arm of the Lord, their savior, their Messiah who was spurned by his nation, and they will mourn. May our observance today be pleasing to him, for we ask it in his worthy and precious name, his name which is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As Dan indicated in this message this morning, uh, in addition to the four names in chapter 9 of Isaiah, Isaiah also refers to the Lord by the term Emmanuel. And in Matthew's account of Christ's birth, we read, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. The virgin of Isaiah's prophecy is a type of the Virgin Mary, who by the Holy Spirit miraculously conceived Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy because he was literally God with us. He was fully human, yet still fully God. Christ came to live in Israel with his people, as Isaiah had foretold. Matthew recognized Jesus as Emmanuel, the living expression of the incarnation, the miracle of the Son of God becoming a human. The Gospel of John beautifully describes the incarnation. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is not a partial revelation of God with us. Jesus is God with us in all his fullness, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus left the glories of heaven and took on the form of a servant. Emmanuel is also our savior. God sent his son to live among us and to die for us on the cross. Through Christ's shed blood, believers are reconciled to God. When we are born of the Spirit, Christ comes to live in us. And our Emmanuel will be with us forever. After his resurrection from the dead, before Jesus returned to the Father, he made this promise, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Therefore, nothing can ever separate us from God and his love for us in Christ Jesus. Let me give thanks for the cup. We thank you, dear Father, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Emmanuel and our Savior, and who came to this earth in the flesh in order to save his people. And we thank you that by his coming, a truly man, Christ's death on the cross accomplished a complete remission for the sins of those who believe in him and his atoning sacrifice. We thank you that Christ provided a salvation we do not deserve and that he saved us by grace alone, through faith alone, in himself alone. We pray, Father, as we take this cup in the remembrance of his death, that we do so with grateful and joyful hearts. And we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to walk in faith in Christ Jesus our Lord and to have the constant assurance that he is always with us. In his name, amen. Let me uh, close our meeting in prayer, please. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together as believers in Christ Jesus and to remember his coming to earth to live and to die on our behalf. We pray that you will encourage each one of us uh, to live the life of faith in him. In his name we pray. Amen.